Good day, everyone. For this lecture, we will be starting the coverage of the second lecture exam, and we will be discussing the different virus families, starting with DNA virus families. All right, so let's start with Pox viridae. Pox viridae is the largest animal viruses known, and it is it has uh, two subfamilies under its wing. You have Entoma pox virinae, which is composed of uh, pox viruses of insects, and Cordo pox virinae, which would be consists uh, consisted of pox viruses of vertebrates. And in the table on the left, you will see all the genera that are included in this subfamily, right? And we will be focusing our efforts as um, as a veterinary school on discussing the viruses that only affects vertebrates. I will not be focusing on Entomopox virinae. Um, if you are like into biology and all that entomology, then go for it. But we will be focusing on pox viruses, which have economic or uh, public health uh, significance in our uh, perspective. All right. That uh, table, if you cannot see it well, it is in the Fenner's Veterinary uh, Virology book, which I will be, which is already actually available to you for download in our class drive folder. All right. So these genera, okay, we have 10 genera under Cordopox variname and uh, some viruses which are still unclassified. Some of it would be the carp edema virus, salmonid gill pox virus, and the squirrel pox virus, which is not falling under any genera. All right. So let us talk about uh, the variant properties of uh, these viruses within the family. All right. As you can see, uh, the left uh, image is an electron microscopy image for pox viruses. It is composed of a single linear double-stranded DNA, and it is known for having a dumbbell-shaped nucleocapsid, and you have lateral bodies, but as of now, it is still of unknown function, all right? The sizes of these viruses ranges from 220 to 450. Some pox viruses are 120, but the max is around 450 nanometers. That is why they are regarded as the largest animal viruses. Basically, at this time, we're in, we have uh, separate lectures on virion morphology, um, viral replication, and such. I will just be enumerating the properties of the viruses, and I would expect that you are um, aware or familiar already about um, such properties, all right? Size is large, shape is pleomorphic, meaning it could have various shape, uh, shapes. Most of them are brick-shaped. Some are ovoid. All right. The surface, as you can see here, some, uh, most, sorry, most pox viruses would have this irregular surface, like on letter A, the image A. Right. You see that the uh, envelope in the nucleocapsid is composed of uh, tubular or globular projections that are arranged in an irregular way. However, on uh, the image B, you can see there is that crisscross arrangement of surface tubules, and that is characteristic for the parapox virus. All right. The structure can be enveloped or non-enveloped. Right? Um, some intracellular mature variant, we know that maturity is infectivity, they do not need the envelope to be um, infectious to a host. Right? And the site of replication is primarily the cytoplasm. Excuse me. Is primarily the cytoplasm. Right? So the pox viridae viral particles, again, are generally enveloped. These are external envelope variants, though the variants that are located intracellularly, which has yet to be enveloped, are also considered infectious already. Right, so how do pox viruses replicate? Right, they enter their host cell through uh, direct fusion of the viral envelope 
um, of the mature virion membrane with the plasma membrane. All right, if you look at the, let me see if I can annotate. All right, you can see right here, all right, the EV is the enveloped virion, all right. And upon binding to the cell surface receptors, which has been found to be at least 10 cell surface receptors that are involved during cell attachment and direct fusion, um, the envelope will be disrupted. It will fuse directly with a cell membrane to release the naked core or the nucleocapsid inside the cell, right? including the lateral bodies, which are seen here as black-shaped uh, um, things <laughs> all right um just remember the so that you don't get lost in the image all right there's a numbers to it all right so that nucleocapsid travels to the perinuclear region along the microtubules remember when we talked about the intracellular tubular network the railroads within the host cell that is how they travel all right, and it goes into this virosome or virus factory. Now, there is a lot of names for this part of the cell near the nucleus wherein most uh, DNA viruses would replicate. All right, the first thing that gets expressed or the first proteins that get synthesized are the early gene pro uh, products which are involved with um, synthesizing for the viral enzymes needed for replication, uh, viral enzymes that need to hijack the cellular machinery and such. We have talked about this already, right? So what's the next one? Um, after the early gene products, of course, comes the intermediate one and the uh, late gene products, right? These include the structural proteins, uh, proteins required for morphogenesis and such. And uh, once the proteins needed or the enzymes needed for the nucleic acid to be replicated, the nucleic acid will then replicate and um, the immature variant is assembled into this uh, single membrane crescents, the half moon shapes. They will develop that um, shape first and then they will be enclosed with the viral core proteins to form that immature variant which is seen here as the iv all right that is then uh, transported to the golgi apparatus right here we're in um three things can happen the golgi apparatus can wrap the variant with a double membrane to produce the wrapped variant here which travels outside to be um to exit the cell through budding or through exocytosis, right? Some can remain on the cell surface to be cell-associated viruses and later to be propelled away from the cell, right? Um, and some would actually remain inside the cell and be, um, what do you call this? Uh, be incorporated into what we call a type inclusion bodies all right when we talked about the cytopathic effects that we can see microscopically and we talked about inclusion bodies so this is one form of um kumbaga end stage for those progeny viruses all right so a uh, virus host and range and tropism there is a uh, relatively a variable host range for pox viruses you have pox viruses which have which have narrow host range. Camel pox will only affect camels. A variola virus would uh, the variola is the causative agent of smallpox, which is only affecting humans. And you also have pox viruses which have a wide range of uh, host they can infect. Monkey pox, even if it is named as such, it can affect primates, squirrels, and ant eaters. Uh, the vaccinia virus can affect humans, cattle, buffalo, and swine, rab uh, swine and rabbits. So um, this, this characteristic for these viruses, which have a wide host range, makes them um, commonly utilized as, as uh, vectors for vaccine, wherein you insert the gene 
of a certain virus inside uh, a vaccine virus and that uh, when you inject that vaccine into a patient that gene will be expressed and you know um, that is an antigenic protein and the immune system can mount an immune response to that protein so that when they encounter the real virus they will be protected already because of your t-cell um, memory uh, sorry memory t-cells right I, I am assuming that you have a solid immune immunology background, so I'm not going to go into that. So when you hear me uh, discuss, you know, some immune immunology mechanisms, let me know if you do not, you know, if you forgot about it, because I'm, I'm going to go at this qu at quite a rapid uh, pace because we have a lot of various families to discuss. Along with Pox Verde, I will also be discussing Aspar Verde and Irido Verde um, along with this video. All right, so um, what do Pox viruses actually cause? Mainly skin pathologies. Pox viruses would have a cell tropism for uh, epidermal keratinocytes. Okay, so they can induce local invasion of uh, these cells, right? Very particular for the ARF virus and the vaccinia virus, which we'll be discussing in a bit, right? And pox viruses, the thing is, they do not rely on specific receptors, right? They can't, they have tropism for this, meaning ito muna yung i-infect nila, but they can also cause systemic spread and cause a more severe uh, level of disease for some animals because they do not rely on specific receptors. Instead, they uh, utilize host molecules present on different cell types in many animal species all right so and um sorry going back to histology we know that keratinocytes have um, immune mechanisms with them they can function as uh, innate immune cells because they possess this uh, molecular sensors for pathogen detection um and even if they have those immune mechanisms, pox viruses have evolved their own set of host response modifiers to um, overcome or circumvent these mechanisms. All right? um, they can cause a negative effect on the immunoregulatory effect of keratinocytes. They can, um, what do you call this, uh, stop or prevent the production of those um, cytokines, which will attract more inflammatory cells. And such. So um, diseases uh, caused by pox viruses, again, these are the ones for humans or affects humans. Um, you, yeah, I have a lot. It's already there. I'm not going to go at it. I'm going to focus on this. Diseases caused in animals, all right? So you will see some viruses which can affect both animals and uh, humans. A lot of uh, some of these are zoonotic, so um, we as veterinarians need to be careful and be knowledgeable about the diseases that can be transmitted to us by the animals that we can handle. All right. So number one, let's start with the avipox viruses. The avipox viruses affect basically avian species. And the most, um, not really most known, but most uh, economically significant would be the fowlpox. Right? The fowlpox is a slow spreading infection. It affects chicken and turkeys, and this actually affects um, the hairless skin, right? as seen in this image. And they can have a, a cutaneous form or a diphtheritic form all right so basically dry and wet form all right in some literature so the cutaneous form or the dry form will only affect uh the cutaneous side of things the skin the hairless skin the hair follicles and such while um spread of these uh, of this virus to the rest of the body usually due to secondary viremia which we discussed already, um, can cause lesions in the upper GI and the respiratory tracts, right? So the route of transmission for this is usually contact through skin abrasions. We know that these animals love to pluck 
you know, beneath their skin, beneath the, the feathers that they have. Um, contact with mosquitoes. Uh, mosquitoes act as mechanical vectors. And scabs, which dried and um, stay within the air, okay, and cause um, aerosol infection. Sorry, can cause aerosol infection when they are inhaled. And those viruses can go inside the host into the respiratory tract, right? The, po the fall pox is resistant to environmental insults, and they have been found to survive for several months in infected scabs, right? This uh, was um, the discovery of the enzyme photolease, right? Um, was found in these infected scabs, and they say that the photolease enzyme are DNA repair enzymes, which repair damage to the DNA, but uh, when it is exposed to UV light, right? And these enzymes require visible light for their own activation and for the actual DNA repair, right? So the lesions for this um, condition, first gross muna, you will see a local hyperplasia of the epidermis, um, will spread to the feather follicle epithelium. It will cause ulceration and then scabbing. And when you get a histopath of that and look at it under the microscope, you will see these uh, large um, eosinophilic intracytoplasmic inside the cell in the cytoplasm. You can see here, right? Okay, this is the cell. The nucleus is the one that is staining basophilic you can see some of the nucleic acid contents there chromatin and then you have this big red staining inclusion bodies right very classic for viral infections specifically for foul pox right so how do we diagnose it with the gross lesions um if you are not well versed or if uh, foul pox is new to you you might think that the wounds that you see are just abrasions from trauma, which is not uncommon in a, in a, in a poultry farm, All right? Um, of course, you can do microscopic examination of affected tissues. Um, you undergo hematoxylin and eosin staining. You will see cytoplasmic inclusion bodies right there, right? White arrows. So if you undergo uh, immunohistochemistry methods, you can do that, right? You can also inoculate the virus into um, chorioallantoic membrane of developing chicken embryos for virus isolation. And um, call this, you have to identify if it is a cutaneous or diphtheritic form because the clinical signs of wet form are similar to other diseases and conditions that might be more common, right? So other than uh, foul pox, uh, other significantly economic, economically significant diseases caused by AV pox viruses would be turkey pox, canary pox, quail pox, and such. Um, they're just typically cutaneous form, but some, again, if they spread systematic, uh, systemically, they can cause around 80 to 90% mortality. So how is it prevented in places where it is endemic? You can vaccinate against it and you don't have to worry about it because if the question arises if it is zoonotic, it is not, All right? Now, um, when we name viruses, as you can see here, it usually refers, the first part of it is usually the host or the reservoir host of the virus. So you would have an idea already, but there are still some viruses which are named as one, like a cowpox, but it is not... Um, it is not entirely exclusive to be affecting only that um, animal species, right? A classic example of that is cowpox because it can only it could also affect um, humans as well, right? Moving on, capri pox viruses and cervid pox viruses. We have a sheep pox, goat pox, and lumpy skin disease, which affects cattle under this genera. They are characterized by, as you can see, eruptions of a skin nodules, which can involve uh, the mucosa of the gastrointestinal tract, respiratory, and gas uh, genital tract. 
Now, aside from the cosmetic effects on these animals, which could be, you know, could lead to a frown to some people when they buy a carcass, um, it also is an economically important disease because it reduces milk production for dairy animals, it increases abortion rates, uh, decreases weight gain, increases the susceptibility to bacterial infections, which um, most often than not, is the ultimate cause of death for some animals when they, uh, when the immune system is already so compromised with uh, viral infections um, that bacterial infections can come in and could invade the animal so easily without the usual immune mechanisms that it has, right? And of course, high mortality. Um, they share, uh, that's why I'm teaching the same, uh, call, uh, sheep pox, gout pox, and lumpy skin disease because they share clinical manifestations. Um, they are not, uh, they cannot be distinguished serologically because you would have a, a cross positivity between them because they have the same genetic makeup. And um, there is a cross protection. Like for example, a cattle gets a, a sheep pox or goat pox. They are also protected already against lumpy skin disease right and the transmission is quite similar to um, foul pox infected scabs uh, respiratory droplets direct contact to these um, nodules and mechanical vectors like biting um, arthropods right as you can see here it's quite distinct the nodules are well circumscribed round slightly raised firm and painful and while lumpy skin disease virus infects only the cattle, some strains of the sheep pox and goat pox viruses may infect both uh, sheep and goats, right? So uh, pathogenesis, basically they have a tropism once again for the epidermal keratinocytes. They will cause ballooning and degeneration. This will form into epidermal microvesicles, which fuse, which makes it very big vesicles. And when they don't have any place to go upon a more distal invasion, they will just ulcerate out. And that will also cause dermal infiltration of inflammatory cells, which causes systemic spread through cell-associated viremia to the following organs, right? Basically the same pathogenesis. Right. Diagnosis, of course, you would have skin biopsies, uh, stained immunohistochemically. You would see these um, this strong dark, uh, dark brown staining label of intracytoplasmic inclusions in the epidermal and uh, follicular keratinocytes and dermal macrophages as seen here. All right. So you can also conduct PCR analysis of these nodules. Um, you can get a swab of the saliva, nasal secretions, or even the blood and do PCR testing to confirm what kind of virus it is. Um, and the thing is, uh, the clinical manifestations of lumpy skin disease and these uh, pox viruses are very similar to ORF or contagious eczema. Right, which is another, which is caused by another pox virus, right? But the uh, ORF is zoonotic, so that's just one big uh, difference between them. Prevention again, vaccination for those countries which in which the virus is endemic in, and it is not zoonotic, right? Now, let's go to the more uh, most commonly um, public health issue for uh, humans as well which would be the parapox of viruses, right? This is a, has a characteristic um, na itchura, <laughs> uh, with a crisscross pattern of the viral surface right here, which is not the same for other pox viruses, which have a irregular surface, right? So this is automatic, your parapox virus. And the most um, economically significant Parapox viruses would be the ORF virus, the pseudocowpox virus, and the bovine papular stomatitis virus. All of them would generally cause localized cutaneous or mucocutaneous lesions. Um, it affects a wide host range, ruminants, cattle, terrestrial, and marine wildlife, uh, including seals and sea lions, even reindeer, some... some um, 
breeds of sorry some species of deer black tail deer red tail deer which is more common in temperate countries and what makes it important is that these are zoonotic diseases right and it usually affects the people who handle these animals the workers the veterinarians uh, the shearers for sheep uh, wool the butchers etc right so they cause usually these kinds of skin lesions and if you got that lesion from handling sheep, it's all it's called orf. Um, if from milking cows, they're called uh, milkers nodules. Right. So let's discuss orf first. Orf is also called a contagious eczema, contagious pustular dermatitis virus, scabby mouth, sore mouth. Right. And they can be transmitted through direct contact with those um, skin lesions. Uh, and also through fomites, which is more common when uh, a sheep with orf um, brushes through like, um, you know, a, a set of vegetation and another sheep would um, be in contact with that. Usually that causes the spread. Um, the variants, the parapox viruses are extremely resistant to environments. The longest that it was found in infected scabs is 12 years the vi the variants were re uh remained to be infectious even after that long all right so where does it usually have tropism for they usually affect the mucocutaneous junction of the muzzle and the lips in lambs and kids this could spread um inside gums palate and tongue and if it is getting in contact with the foot around the coronet area. It could predispose the animal to the entry of a certain bacteria, which is Dermatophilus congolensis. And you would know this better with the disease it causes, which is strawberry foot rot, right? So how, uh, well, how does this affect the body? Um, it causes epidermal hyperplasia and hypertrophy, neutrophil infiltration, basically the same thing. All right, um, the lesions that are associated with ORF are found to be easily bleeding with minor um, manipulation or minor um, stimuli. It is because the virus infected cells express a homologue of the vascular endothelial growth factor, which if you remember, this growth factor is what is, is very active, actively produced during wound healing phase. That um, you need to reconstruct the blood flow into a certain area, then it destroy like a possible trauma or a skin, a skin lesion, and new capillary buds would form, and the virus infected cells actually cause that to be secreted, and that causes more bleeding. Right in humans, it starts as papules, which becomes pustules and becomes thick crusts. Um, the, the normal course of the disease in some animals is one to four weeks, uh, but some it can persist to four to, uh, to nine weeks, then heal on its own without scarring. Um, natural infection actually renders an animal uh, immune, almost immune. They are very highly resistant to reinfection. Um, when this affects young animals like lambs and kids, they do not eat normally and they lose their body condition and that causes that mortality. Um, extensive lesions on the feet can cause lameness. Um, if it uh, goes, if the kids or lambs suckle from the mom, this could uh, cause lesions on the teats of the ewes and cause mastitis and become gangrenous. So uh, morbidity is high, but mortality is not due to the lesions caused by the virus, but because the the the, the young cannot suckle anymore, right? So, um, as you can, if you can observe, I'm going through the diseases quite fast because you will be discussing these uh, diseases once again when you go to med, right? When you go to your ruminant med, when you go to equine med, you know that species specific medicine subjects. You will be discussing all this, and there you will be focusing on diagnosing and treatment of the disease. So I will not be discussing how you fix it, how you, not much 
on the diagnosis part and how you treat it because you have medicine subject for it. I'm going to focus on how the virus actually leads to the clinical manifestation of the disease it causes, right? Because that's the subject, right? So pseudocalpox, it is uh, named as such because um, it resembles the cowpox lesion, but it is uh, they were found to be of different genome sequences. So it says pseudocalpox. Um, it usually affects the teats and the other of cows and Yes, the muzzles and the mouths of nursing calves. It has a characteristic ring or horseshoe-shaped scabs which develop, right? And transmission, as you would expect, cross-suckling of calves, improperly disinfected teat clusters of milking machines, and they can also be transmitted mechanically by flies, right? So this usually lasts 7 to 12 days if handlers... Um, acquire it from the animals they handle, the lesions they develop in their um, skin. On their skin are called milkers nodules, and they're itchy, they're purple red, and they usually appear uh, disappear after two weeks. All right. So the bovine papular stomatitis virus would usually affect the oral mucosa, the gums as well, and they would usually affect younger animals those less than two years right um there's a lot of animals that have shown to have subclinical uh, infection with this virus so it's not really causing that much problem and the thing is with both of these uh, reinfection is quite common right and the importance of knowing these diseases or the viruses that cause these diseases is that they're very uh, the clinical manifestations are very similar to more important uh, diseases, which is foot and mouth disease, blue tongue. But that is if the clinical sign is accompanied by fever, lameness, and salivation. All right. So moving on to, I think, the last genera that we will be discussing, orthopox. All right. Starting with cowpox virus. Okay. We're back to the virus, which has a very irregularly um, designed surface, right? And the reservoir host for cowpox virus is quite a misnomer because you would expect cowpox virus would affect cows, right? But its reservoir hosts are actually rodents from which it can spread to other hosts like cows, cats, humans, yes, <laughs> large felids, and uh, zoo animals, right? So uh, this causes disseminated uh, ulcerative lesions of the skin and mucosal membranes in animals, but in humans, it is just known for single eruptions. In cats, though, when they get cowpox, it's more severe and systemic from the skin, spreading to the pharynx, esophagus, and then causing pulmonary infection and full viremic spread. Now, um, you might know you might know cowpox with how it was used to develop a smallpox virus. And I will not be discussing that anymore <laughs> because we have al already repeated how Edward Jenner used this and that, you know, the, the milker, uh, the milker's virus and such. So, you know that story. I, I, don't, I, I don't think I need to repeat that, right? So, next, <laughs> camel pox virus. This is a, pot a potentially zoonotic disease in, indig in indigenous camel populations. This is one of the pox viruses which has a narrow host range. It only affects camels, right? Primarily local skin disease, which could spread uh, in into the respiratory system and upper GI systems. Transmission, right there. And natural infection would usually lead to lifelong immunity to reinfection, right? Next, the extramelia virus or the mousepox virus. Note, this is always in the boards. <laughs> I still remember that question. Um, ectro means abortion. Melia is limp. So it is very known, this virus is known for causing um, problems with the limbs of animals born with ectromelia or um, they suffer from the pathology of this virus and cause partial limb amputations, right? The transmission of this would be direct contact, especially in rodent populations, in research facilities and breeding facilities. Um, the mouse trains actually dictate resistance and susceptibility to the virus. 
you have the AKR, see if the 7BL are resistant, then you have other ones which are susceptible, right? So what does it cause? It causes a multifocal necrosis in the liver, lymphoid tissues, spleen, and the limbs, lastly, which causes partial limb amputation. And this is just important, especially for research facilities, because um, for institutions which uh, import or buy rodents, ma uh, mice, and rats, um, sorry, mice, not rats. Um, they cannot sell these animals if they are positive for this virus. So there's a screening for all animals in a research facility and in breeding facility for laboratory animals to make sure that they don't, they are not incubating any disease with them. So it, you have laboratory animal medicine for this, but yeah, you have different criteria for how germ-free your research animals are. You have specific pathogen free. You have the ultimate. Wala siya talagang, uh, wala siyang ini incubate na anything, which actually makes it susceptible to any kind of bacteria or virus. So you're gonna discuss all that. So oh, orthopox is not the last. We have the molluscum contagious virus, which I'm only discussing because it affects humans. All right. It has been found in others, animal species, but only causes disease in humans, right? And the pathology that it causes is, is quite characteristic. They're raised, they're round, they're small, around one four inch in diameter, and they're red, uh, red colored, right? So when you do a biopsy or histopathology of this, you will see hypertrophied cells, right? Big cells containing this molluscum bodies right they're named as molluscum bodies which are large hyaline acidophilic cytoplasmic masses all right so again um oh sorry uh this virus is transmitted by direct contact minor abrasions um sexual contact as well in developed countries they say that the sources of contagion would be communal swimming pools and gymnasiums um it is just usually associated with human contact. In horses, they can get infected, but it's self-limiting, meaning it will it will be seen and then it will just die down by itself. So yeah, that's molluscum contagiosum. Exoma virus, which is a lepari pox virus, is causing severe generalized disease in European rabbits or the Oryctolagus coniculus, wherein it causes the disease called myxomatosis. Right, and that is seen as blepharoconjunctivitis in um in these rabbits, swelling of the muzzle and the anogenital region. All right, they say that there's a leonine appearance, which I don't know what it looks like. They say it looks like a lion. Uh, I don't see it. <laughs> right. So where uh, what's the cell tropism for this? They would go for the dendritic cells and cause to spread to the local macrophages, other epidermal cells, go to the lymph node, and lead to secondary uh, viremia, right? Transmission is direct contact, arthropod bites, respiratory droplets, which if the myxoma virus is transmitted through the res respiratory system, it only, it causes a condition which is amyxomatous myxomatosis, wherein there is no, um, lesions in the skin, but the only clinical signs that you will see are associated with the respiratory tract. And why is this important? This is actually used in 1950 to eradicate um, okay. feral European rabbits. There came a time where in rabbits are pests in um, Europe, where, so they used the myxoma virus to kill these animals. But the thing is, that was just such a big mistake. <laughs> Because they only led to the emergence of animals which are myxomatosis resistant and the development of various variants which are less, uh, call this, not less dangerous, oh, yeah, less uh, pathogenic but more transmissible, right? And for those less virulent variants, it actually caused a localized uh, disease, right? Um, Wait, I'm trying to remember what else I know about 
Mixomers have patience with Doc, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, basically, this is a very immunosuppressive disease because of its um, predilection to the dendritic cells that actually immunocompromises the animal to begin with and causes further damage to the animal. All right, so that is it for Pox Verde. I did not expect this to be 40 minutes long, because I, but this is one of the biggest uh, virus families that we will be discussing. The next one, the next um, video would be about uh, Asphar Verde and Irido Verde. And because of the, the similarity of these two families with each other, they are just going to be in one video. All right. If you have any questions, let me know. I have not been receiving any questions from you guys, so I'm not sure if you're still in there. Um, so, yeah, I hope the rest of the sem will be like this, right? We're just going to be discussing the different virus families. It will be following this same format wherein we first discuss the properties, then the replication, and then the diseases. All right. So basically, that is it for the entire sem. Alright, so I'll see you on the next video. Thank you.